I am Dr. Dr. Daniel Dool. I am a researcher in um, music and in theater studies. And my main field are theater analysis, music analysis, and especially opera analysis and performance analysis. And today I, at FU Best, I will be speaking about a very important topic in music, which is uh, decolonizing classical music, the future of black German musicians. So as a scholar and as a musician, I've been uh, thinking about this topic for a very long time, uh, say decades. And uh, today I would like to give you a, so a small introduction. So if I would like to sum up what is the perspective of a more uh, specific German perspective on, on uh, decolonial topic, it would be, first of all, uh, history to remind that there is a long and huge history of um, black people and people of color in German context, which is um, from a colonial discourse and from a colonial perspective, always negate. Uh, negate. So first it has to be reminded that um, the construction of uh, for no Germany um, was not what was not and was never uh, white and only white and Christian. This is a huge work from um, biography and a huge work also um, for creating a new archives. Um, the second point will be to acknowledge the colonial German uh, history. So, uh, 1884-1885, um, uh, Bismarck organized the so-called Berlin uh, Conference, where all um, European uh, colonial powers just um, organized themselves to to divide Africa um, under themselves. So Germany is a pretty important actor in the colonial history from the 19th century, but not only. And uh, it's important also to remind of this context to be also able to analyze what kind of discourses are uh, um, in Germany and also their continuity and their consequences today, and especially when we are talking about uh, racism. The third point would be empowerment of black people, indi ind indigenous and people of color communities in Germany. So as I uh, um, said before, uh, in the 90s, uh, we could see for the first time a very um, systematic hate crimes on black people and people of color in Germany. So also the community started to organize themselves from the 90s, from this moment, very also systematically to create some resistance and to be able to defend themselves. So this tradition from empowerment is uh, not very new, it's not from the 90s, but uh, now you're also more uh, intersectional and um, work from um, community work and also with work with um, allyship uh, between people of color, black people and also with uh, white people who are also questioning the colonial power or see the injustice of such uh, power when uh, white people benefit of it if they like or do not. And the last one is of course the intersectional race theory and practices. So in Berlin, you have the Center for Intersectional Justice, who is uh, doing a huge work of pedagogy and also uh, the lot of um, um, how do you say advocate and law people in this center. So who are working on very practical level, um, also to address the law and to address the uh, practices of how the law is applied or not, etc. Et no, how does all of this is working for classical music? That will be our next point. Decolonizing classical music is a topic that uh, several musicologists have tried to address since the 80s. One of the most important of this musicologist is Kofi Agavu, 
with snow in, I'm not sure where, he's in the US for sure. And um, I would say representing African music, post-colonial and cannot see. And positions would be one of the most, yes, post-colonial notes, queries and position would be about 2003. Yes. So Kofi Agar is a very um, offer a very interesting position because he's um, he's coming from the semiotic field. So as a semiotician, he uh, also proposed a very interesting analysis of how discourse and how meaning is emerging within the musical analysis and within the musical discourse. So um, in the postcolonial notes from 2003 and then. The music as a discourse, semiotic adventure in romantic music, is um, making um, the construction work and also uh, genealogic work, um, looking at how this discourse is emerging and working with the semiotic oh wait, semiotical tools. This would be a short introduction to. Uh, some theories of um, Diglonia theories and practices. Um, now coming to classical music and um, having um, speaking about uh, Kofi Agavu, I would like to come to the common time today um, to give you an, um, yes, a small overview of what possibilities um, do we have in decolonized classical music. I would like to introduce you to three awesome researchers um, who are working in uh, the German context. Uh, there are um, Professor Joseph uh, Lewis, who is also a composer, uh, talking about diversity, which would be the first context, uh, the first topic in classical music. Um, so right now, diversity is a very um, high um, topic and also very, the practices of diversity in classical music is very, very problematic. And Joris is addressing this problematic on a, yes. And yes, and Joris is addressing this problematic of diversity in classical music. Keeping the discourse on diversity in contemporary music in Europe alive, which was surprising me because I thought, is it in danger of dying? Well, maybe it is. I mean, because really, I've also started to consider the possibility that diversity discourse, you know, it's reached, it's made a lot of progress, but it might have reached its peak. And I know a lot of people among us were just getting started with diversity, and now to have somebody come along and say that it might already be all over, you know, it's like, uh, it could be annoying, but you should hear me out, you should hear me out on this. I mean, I've been hearing about diversity for a really long time, you know, and uh, over the decades, just to give you an idea of the time frame, I have experienced a lot of skepticism around the term and how institutions deploy it. I'm thinking about Sarah Ahmed's wonderful book, uh, where she talks about implementations of diversity discourse by institutions. I've noticed this and also in my recent work seem to tout diversity's gender face while hoping that no one really notices or cares about the absence of discussion of race and ethnicity. And that's particularly the case in Western Europe where gender statistics are more readily available than other demographic vectors and often the refusal to log race and ethnicity outcomes that people seem to justify because it's, you know, promotes national unity or avoids those nasty identity politics. Um, but uh, as one scholar put it, the negation of these identities may be just a tactic for consolidating the position of dominant groups. And certainly in a decolonizing discursive environment, you have to consider these kinds of tactics in the way that governments and, uh, and other kinds of institutions use the ch what this, this scholar called the choice of ignorance to avoid uh, really coming to grips with some of the, um, avoid scrutiny for their actions. Um, because really taken historically, 
gender and ethnicity, race, they go together. I think people started calling it gender race now. And under any colonizing regime, it's women who bear the brunt of this oppression, but the oppression is also experienced intersectionally. That is with race. And, and so we have to think about that in the sense that progress on gender alone isn't really enough, and we should be suspicious and really impatient with those who insist that we can do gender first and do race later. I mean, so yes, so this is a very small, small extract of the uh, huge presentation by uh, George Lewis, and he's addressing a very interesting issue, which is uh, the single issues in the German landscape. So the, um, as soon as it comes to address um, issues of discrimination in Germany, um, the response, um, the he he hegemonial response is most of the time a single issues. So um, what he's talking about here is um, addressing the sexism in classical music, which is um, now pretty huge, also because of some scandal in classical in classical music. And um, so um, a lot of person are, are talking about, so let's take care about sexism first. And now we also have classism as second and maybe race. So this thought of single issues is very problematic because it can be also played against each other. So first sex and then and then race and then class. And this is problematic because um, uh, these single issues are um, also negating the experience and the life, the life experience of a lot of also musicians who are uh, living in the intersection of this experience. So being a black person, being a queer person, being a musician, being maybe Muslim, um, uh, all this oppression are working together. So the response would should also be uh, an, an intersectional response and not first class and then and that. So he's also addressing the problematic of diversity as a single issues. The second person I would like to uh, present is uh, Dr. Kira Thurman, who has been working on opera and especially on the uh, black singers in German context and how they have been received um, in the end of 19th and uh, 20th century, and especially uh, in the Wagner um, era. So what this is what she's saying. And um, I'm going to begin our conversation on Wagnerism by instead bringing up Beethoven. Um, this summer, I accidentally became Twitter famous for wading into a debate, was Beethoven Black? And like any good historian and musicologist worth her salt, I said that I wasn't interested in that question so much as the history of it. Um, so Black people have been uh, claiming that Beethoven was Black since at least the 1930s. And their reasons for doing so are complex and layered. Um, on the one hand, sort of it's subversive to associate uh, Beethoven is a sort of quote-unquote musical genius with blackness, uh, which is something that white Americans denied. So this is sort of an argument that Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael make a lot, or made a lot. Um, but on the other hand, and this is sort of going to get us, I think, to Alex to Alex Alex's book, uh, is thinking about how African Americans had an affinity for the music of Beethoven, uh, and that claiming Beethoven became a way of claiming Western art music for themselves. Um, in both my first book project and my next project, I take seriously Black engagements with classical music and try to consider how their performances, listening practices, compositions, both laid claim to um, and often undid the bounds of Western art music uh, and racial politics of the day. So for my forthcoming book called uh, Singing Like Germans, Black Musicians in the Land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, I trace uh, Black musicians mostly from the United States, the, the Caribbean, and Latin America, uh, who sort of traveled to Germany in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and they're there to perform the music of Beethoven and the music of Wagner. Um, and so I look at their performances and how they're sort of understood, and how in particular white audiences in Germany uh, and Austria are understanding them. Um, I have made this joke a ton, so please bear with me, but uh, if Western art music is considered a, is a uni universal language, quote unquote, it has a very strong German accent. 
uh, the music of the Austro-German canon of composers like Beethoven or Wagner um, is in a lot of ways, I think a lot of historians and musicologists say it's a paradox, right? That it's somehow considered both universal while still being the sort of audible expression of a local or national sense of self. So my question for my first book, uh, which I am turning over next week, um, <laughs> right, <laughs> thanks. Right, so my question for my first book was if this music is considered a quote unquote universal language, what happens when people of color start speaking it? So, and that would be Kira Thaman. Her uh, last book will come now uh, in September. Um, huge work, so I can highly recommend it. And what he, she uh, talking about here is about the uh, universalism and the universalist perception of music in um, German context. So this idea that the Beethoven music and the music of uh, genius composers is universalist is, yes, um, is um, a problem when uh, Black people and people of color are starting to compose, starting to compose uh, this classical music and starting also to receive it and starting to practice it. So, which is actually also not a very new phenomenon. So, you have um, you have black people since the Baroque in the in Cuba, in Brazil, and also in Spain in very different uh, contexts and spaces. Um, classical music were never only written by uh, exclusively, exclusively uh, white male uh, cis people. It's just, um, it's just a story, it's a narrative which has been repeated until um, it's become an evidence. And that's what um, uh, we can address also as work to on um, uh, to make a decolonial work in the classical music. First, to look um, at this uh, narration and this uh, myth and this legend of um, white genius, white genius male um, composer in classical music. Mm -hmm. I will come to the third uh, speaker, which is uh, Naomi Andre. Naomi Andre, um, Professor Naomi Andre, who is working in the US, also an opera um, analyst. And what is she saying is also an important. Let me just show you. I also think that opera companies are becoming more open about sort of what do these things mean? How do we perform these operas? It was never an issue that people talked about when I was going to the opera of saying, why are we using blackface makeup on Otello and Aida? And why do we have yellow face makeup for Chocho San, you know, Butterfly, and in Turandot? Like that doesn't happen in films or Broadway or, TV or even in high schools anymore. You know, what does this mean that we're doing this? And a lot of people would say to me when I brought that up, oh, Naomi, you're too sensitive. It's not real. It's on the stage. Oh, nobody cares about those things. It's opera. And I'm thinking, I care a lot about opera and I care about those things too. So let's begin to talk about it. But I, I found, and this sort of hooks into my current research, that nobody was asking, there wasn't an easy way to talk about it. I wasn't saying, this is horrible, we should censor opera, but more like, this is something we need to talk about because it's a little painful to see this. It's a little, it's resonating weirdly. Nobody else is doing this or other genres in big forms. Why can't we talk about it? So what um, Naomi Andre is talking about is um, about racist practices. Uh, there are a lot of racist practices in uh, on opera stages. Uh, blackface is just one of them. And um, she's one of the few scholars who are um, addressing these issues with, uh, yeah, of course, with uh, Kira and myself. And uh, addressing these issues in, in opera is um, very, uh, difficult way. So doing this, um, me doing this in the German context, I would also have the very similar response as um, she said. So you know, it's about you, you are sensitive, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, uh, now it's starting to move a bit, but still to um, 
rare context to, to make the context of the colonial context um, clear, it's, uh, it's a long work. It's a long work and I'm not the only one who have been uh, speaking up in theater practices and opera, um, opera practices. So the, the, the work, this decolonial work in um, German context would be to, um, to make clear that there is a huge link uh, from colonial practices um, when um, directors, stage directors choose to use black face or to use yellow face on an opera scene as, and then claim it as a tradition. This is, I found, uh, an important um, an important view of this problematic of this topic of um, decolonization in classical music. And the last scholar I would like to introduce, do I have it? Yes, which is Harald Kizidu, uh, who is doing a huge work on analyzing um, jazz music and popular music and also the influence of jazz musicians in of black musicians in jazz music and um, experimental music in Germany, which is a huge field. So neue Musik und experimentale Musik. I illuminate the creative tension between the realms of music and politics that shaped the production and reception of Boltzmann's music during the lat latter half of the 1960s and situates his work within the larger context of the rise of the new left and the West German student protest movement during this period. Moreover, I discuss the building of alliances between segments of the West German student protest movement and the black freedom movement in the US as an important backdrop for Bretzmann's engagement with black experimentalism. I elucidate the ways in which this engagement spawned a normatively charged notion of music as a medium of social critique, which was instrumental in Bretzmann's coming to terms with the burden of the national socialist past and thereby for her self position in West Germany's post war society. In a 1977 essay, the influential German jazz critic, impresario, and record producer Joachim Ernst Behrendt asserted that the imitative era of German and European jazz ended in the early 1960s. Presumably taking a cue from Scottish trumpeter and writer Ian Carr, who had advanced the notion of the emancipation of British jazz from American slavery already in 1973 in regards to English pianist Mike Westbrook's late 1960s recordings, Behrendt declared German jazz departed from American jazz in the mid 1960s and deployed the term de-emancipation or emancipation for this ensuing individuation process. So yes, this is one of the of the very few uh, um, ID you can have from his uh, huge uh, theory, and um, I find it very in interesting the analysis of um, yes the influences of um, U.S. and also Black German musician in the jazz context and also in the experimental music. So coming now to the last person was offering an, an analysis of opera, also still opera, so myself. So uh, 2014, I wrote a short essay about racialization in contemporary German theater. In this essay, I was analyzing um, three very well-known um, uh, women um, character, which are Carmen, Aida, and Salome. So three um, characters who are not not white and also are um, becoming um, femme fatale in very specific ways in the opera. So the process of racialization, I uh, I told uh, what made in through several filters. So you have a filters through the dramaturgy, how the 
character are constructed, uh, which um, how they are moving, how they are thinking, which specific um, specific character they have. The second one would be rationalization on the stage. So when the first filter is more on what they are saying and what the music is telling about this character, the second one is a very, very actual one. It's um, how the, the directors, opera directors, who are most of the time white and male, are constructing with their uh, colonial imagination, are constructing um, all the time and repeating um, colonial fantasies. And the, the third one would be the embodiment, which is a, also a very interesting uh, perspective of how you, and this one you can analyze for um, meaning is emerging. And I can read the definition as racialized embodiment. I mean the racialization of the stage element from the stage direction to politic of casting. And um, that's then I quote uh, a very, a very well known director, but I will not read it for now. So this is an ensemble how the body are becoming um, a meaning, a signification, only through the people who are looking at these bodies. And in the opera context, we most of the time have a white gaze and a, and a male gaze together. Um, together also emerging a very colonial gaze. So this uh, would be the basic for interpretation in opera analysis, which need to be addressed. That would be my contribution to this topic. So now knowing this, what next? So I would like to propose very concrete, very concrete uh, actions about what can we do in a decolonial to to have a decolonial movement in classical music. So eight point first point acknowledge that there are black indigenous and people of color composer in classical music. Second one acknowledge a plural and very rich history outside of the canonical thought. So that's what I was um, saying in uh, further about the canon. Third, just play music by black people, indigenous and people of color composers because they are there. Just have to um, look at the music and play them. And this, it comes to the fourth point, then only then it is possible to also start a her or her story of interpretation called Interpretationsgeschichte. That means the more often you play um, something, you play a work, the, the, the better it becomes also uh, a tradition and an interpretation. You can create an interpretation um, of this work, um, which needs first to be started uh, because, yeah, first the music needs to be to be played. The fifth would be to build new practices. And I was telling this point because uh, nowadays it's very difficult to move um, institutions um, as it academia or in concert, zelle, opera. So they are moving very, very, very slowly. So it's also important to build structures out, outside of the institutions. That's what I mean with build new music practices. Also to build practices and offer music practices outside not only outside of the institution, but also outside of traditional concert, um, concert places, which are um, very specific place in, within the city. So also not be afraid of play in places, in popular places, in places which where there are not a lot of uh, classical music. Number six, reflect classical music within the political discourses and practices and this would be a response to the very um the majority of the the ideology today in germany which is l'art pour l'art so which means um 
it would be separated the artist and their art would be very very strongly separated from what from their personality from their context from the social and cultural context so you can have someone like wagner and who is very problematic uh, personality but doing great art or you can have someone like Debussy, um, who is who had some very um, problematic um, titles in his work, but doing also great art with pentatonic and how is he's having his pentatonic and how the assimilation of this music uh, will not be possible without the Exposition Universelle. So we have to to make the link to this because artists are of course living within society. So uh, L'Art Polar would be one possibility to read art, but it shouldn't be the only one. Sec uh, seventh would be to, yes, analyzing um, ideological thought in production and reception of classical music, which is actually a consequence of number six. And number eight, create new structures. So I talk in number five to create new practices, but also create new structure outside of this actual structure with creating new uh, new group, um, new collaborations, um, yes, outside of what is now existing. And talking about the new structure, I would like to end with the, a concert, a small concert and a small um, hope with the string orchestra, a small ensemble of string um, a string ensemble created by uh, myself and several other uh, black and people of color uh, in Berlin, Germany, and uh, which focuses is to play black people and composers of color and indigenous composers in Berlin. Thank you very much. <laughs>